Good dog, good dog. Hello, everyone. And uh, we are on our way to Norway. Oh, can you hear me there? Um, so I'm going to talk about this uh, great part of the, the world. Maybe many of you have already been there a number of times. I've had the pleasure to be uh, up and down the coast many times. Uh, but just uh, a little bit of news. You may, uh, after we've been around the British Isles and sailed from there, the historic decision to Brexit, uh, I can only think what the Norwegians are saying because they have been firmly independent while still part of Europe for all this modern period. They're neither a member of the EU nor the Eurozone, and so I think they're probably um, uh, looking across the sea and saying, well, now the Brits understand why we never joined. And Norway has become the, the richest country of Europe per capita over the last few decades, mainly because of oil wealth. And so you have a contrast uh, that you can appreciate when we're there. <clears throat> but uh, it is uh, just part of the greater European puzzle. Now I'm going to just show you where we are crossing the Norwegian Sea, it's called, from Iceland across to central Norway. And of course, we've been up in the Arctic Ocean just above the Arctic Circle, 66.6 .6 degrees north. And isn't it remarkably calm and warm? Well, so, Somehow we have had the, the arrangement that whenever we are at sea, we get a little we get a fog, a little rain. As soon as we land ashore, it's suddenly sunny. So I hope that's true when we cross over to central Norway. Bergen's right on the bulge of the western coast of Norway. And then you can see the British Isles, Ireland, and the continent. Um, but this sea is, it has a very tremendous deep in it between Iceland and Norway, and of course Norway has this tremendous coast, almost a thousand kilometers all the way up to above the Arctic Circle and a few islands up toward the polar ice cap. And that's where it uh, gets very dramatic up there. But meanwhile, we're going across Iceland, Faroe Islands, right to right about Bergen. But this sea has a very um, profound deep in it. It also has very strong cold currents that pour out of the Arctic Ocean and then down into the deep. Um, over 3,000 um, uh, <clears throat> meters deep in some parts. And then there are these ridges where it flows. And there's a, a contrasting current that's coming up from the North Atlantic, which is the tail end of the Gulf Stream. So you have warm waters combining with very cold Arctic waters, which create, particularly in the winter, a lot of storms and turbulence and, and uplift of minerals and a very rich sea, particularly for fishing traditionally. Now. This, in another uh, month and in another ship, we could be having a, a real roller coaster of a ride. Uh, and so this is one of the most dangerous seas in the world in the winter in particular. Uh, I encourage you to come back and really have that experience if you really like it. But meanwhile, uh, it's also been the place where mariners have a, uh, a, a great training because of the difficulty of the coast and the currents and the tides are tremendous big tides. And, some of the fjords up to, again, uh, 10 to 15 meters every day. So you have a, a great wash in and out of the sea in these narrow passages. You get great swirling um, uh, eddies. And then you have the great maelstrom, which is off the Lofotel Islands, right north of where we are at Bergen, where there are whirlpools, standing whirlpools that will take a small boat right down into the deep. Now, have I scared you yet? Well, if not. Uh, as we are going to Bergen, you may look over the edge and see a big eye blinking at you. Don't worry, it's just the next character in another Disney movie, and it's even if it talks. But this was the great fear of sailors coming out of uh, Norway, is that the sea monsters get them, and, and some will swear that they're still out there. Of course, the, the Kraken is probably just a giant squid and a number of them that live in the bottom of the Norwegian deep. Well, anyway. Uh, if you have any trouble, you can always sing to a mermaid, and she'll come and help you out. So that's your relief. <clears throat> now, this is Norway. Again, just a, a general map. You see it stretches all these islands, fjords, some towns in all of this area, all the way up. The Lofotel Islands are right off the crest of Norway. You notice a, the kingdom of Norway. It's a constitutional republic. But then you go up right up to the Norkop. It's called the very far north end of Europe. Uh, almost 70 degrees north, and other islands further out there. But that's where it becomes, uh, like Iceland, very barren and very exposed to the sea. And then we, I've sailed all the way up through there. And up in that part of Norway, you still have 
perhaps the last aboriginal peoples of Europe, which are the Sami, or we know them as Laplanders. And these are nomadic reindeer herding people. Now, this is an old picture when they were living in tents, but they're um, living um, like uh, comparable to the Inuit Native Americans in the polar regions, and they actually have a, a polar council of the native peoples of the far north. The Sami people are migratory between Norway, Sweden, and Russia, and they have native rights up there. But that's, again, far from where we are down in central Norway where they are not. Well, the Norwegians as we know them, like the Swedes and the Danes and the Finns, are the stock of Europeans that have come up and in prehistory settled these areas. And these are where the settlements of uh, the medieval era uh, Vikings came from in the beginning of their excursions. So, of course, Norway was very close to Sweden, over the hills and the glaciers. And so Sweden and Norway have had a, a long and contested um, competition. And then for centuries, uh, Norway was part of Sweden. Then it was given to Denmark. And then it had uh, its independence only in 1905 as a separate nation. But these far-flung settlements in the fjords and the broadlands were uh, considered very wild and um, um, uninhabitable places by the continental Europeans. This is an old Latin text about the, the mythical people in the far north that could turn into birds and wolves and were or some, uh, not really civilized, let's say, to put it politely. But actually, they were very industrious and very capable, first of all, building boats which then led to their expansion around all of this area. I told you the other time that the word Viking or Viking is actually a verb which means to go from bay to bay in your boat. And so that was the commerce, fishing, they catch cod and other herring and salt it and then pack it and ship it inland and then to the continent. And so these are the medieval trades that led to the establishment of the trading routes across Scandinavia and then to the rest of the continent and parts of the world. So this is still the case in many communities. They're based in fishing and other uh, forestry. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the remains of the medieval Viking period show a high degree of, let's say, trade and domesticity. These are actually walrus ivory cones taken out of a traditional tomb but they're most famous for their metalwork. They never had ceramics. They always smelted ore and made uh, uh, tin, bronze, brass, copper goods like this. Uh, that's the drinking cup. And then many amulets and um, uh, metalwork have been found in the large tombs that are spread around all through Scandinavia, up Norway. Norway being the least populated compared to Sweden or Denmark or, or Finland even. Well, this is an amulet of Tour, the god of war, which was worn by a warrior chieftain out on his expeditions. But back at home, there was a lot of metallurgy, fine gold work, silver work, again, uh, utilitarian copper and bronze. But these are, again, taken out of tombs. But a lot of the coins came from um, parts of Russia and then down to the Middle East because the Viking trading route extended through Russia. And so this fine metalwork is still a hallmark in um, Scandinavia, more advanced manufacturing now. But these, again, are amulets and decorations, clasps that were found, go back to two to 300 AD and then into the more modern period. Most famous were their swords, though, because they had fine uh, metalwork decorations, uh, um, <clears throat> sort of a crude steel quality of sword. And then they began trading with places like Damascus and Baghdad for um, metal works to improve the armament so that uh, the Vikings then became a very well-armed and then aggressive force uh, to the rest of the world. These are a couple of their old forts, one in uh, Firkat in uh, Denmark. And so this then carried over to England. Here's one in Scotland, Balabdul, another circular fort, probably had wooden staves and then the encampment and then the farmlands outside. So the Vikings, uh, uh, mil uh, by military force, settled into um, England, Scotland, Ireland, Iceland, as we've seen, and then into northern Europe, and particularly Normandy was the Viking conquest in France. So this was the quality of their metalwork, chain mail, helmets, 
This was found near Stockholm a number of years ago. It almost looks Grecian in their quality, but it must have been quite a sight with these big warriors in their regalia. And they were pretty much unstoppable. They, um, they had uh, the charming quality of uh, drinking spirit or distilled liquors to get completely drunk before they go battle. And then they would, the shock troops would be called the berserkers, which literally means the bear shirt. They'd get on a bear uh, fur and their armament, and then they would just go berserk, as we still call it to this day. Well, they had a great cosmology um, of gods, spirits in the woods. Uh, they worshiped mountains and trees. And the, the great god, though, was the one-eyed Odin, who uh, lost his eye in battle but could see into the future with his one good eye. And then uh, the, uh, the common ethical uh, text of the ancients was called the uh, Havamal, which is sort of that's been called the uh, Viking uh, Tao Te Ching, which a lot of spiritual um, encouragements, um, enjoy every day, count the stars, be kind to your family, be ruthless to the enemy, and uh, many sayings. You can still buy, I saw a copy of it in the bookstore in um, Akareri yesterday, uh, but that's part of the ethical tradition of the Norwegians, Vikings in general. Here's the great god Thor, who with his hammer could cause earthquakes and um, lightning and thunder and was, uh, a, again, a, a sort of a god of war. And his amulet was worn for good luck by uh, the men. And then when Christianity came, they extended the, the shaft of that and became the Christian cross adapted into Scandinavia. Uh, here's Helgar, who was the messenger between the gods. There's all the sagas and many m myths and stories about all of these uh, different characters. Tur, again, another warrior god taming a great dragon. And here's Sigmund and Regan, who were a pair that um, were uh, in conflict with the gods and with their own tribe and had many adventures and many stories. That became the source of the mythology of the Ring of the Nibelungenlied, also uh, characters that were then developed in Tolkien and uh, uh, Lord of the Rings and things, fantasies like that. So this is very much a, a, a tradition that's gone into modern literature and fantasy productions. The elaboration of the dragon particularly was very um, pronounced uh, in these gold hammered uh, filials on the chariots and boats. And so this was always the, the symbol of the uh, the cosmos on Earth. Uh, it was said that this serpent dragon, the Yoga Mugand, which was the the creature that was always pursuing its own tail and getting twirled up in itself, as a metaphor of the complexities of the of life on Earth. And so that's a figure that you'll see still in um, carvings and in modern um, art in in Scandinavia, Norway. But here's a a, a runic carving, where, where the Jorgamund snake serpent has the letters written out, which are the, the, uh, the old um, Viking uh, alphabet, which would then spell out uh, names and places and rudimentary grammar. Uh, this was before Roman letters were introduced to become the modern language up here. But here's an example of a, of a uh, effigy that was buried again in a chieftain's tomb of of the sun being drawn over the sky. Now this may have come um, from uh, Central Asia because the, the Viking incursion into Russia extended down all the rivers and even the word Russia refers to Rus, which was the name of the uh, Scandinavians who invaded um, <clears throat> what is now Russia back in the uh, 5th, 6th, 7th century. So these sort of cosmic symbols came down from perhaps from somewhere in Asia like a yin and a yang symbol but it has uh, relations to some of the Celtic uh, uh, symbology too. But this is the wheel of life with the Jorgamund and serpent uh, effigies. And then this is put into the jewelry and into the decoration on uh, buildings and even on churches. So this has got very elaborate filigree gold uh, shields. And of course, you, you can see it in, uh, in, in, in plastic versions in the souvenir shops. But uh, this is considered to be the, the source of life. They call it Yggdrasil, or the world tree, which was a never-endingly growing and destroying tree that would 
growing on itself, and it had creatures all living in the midst of this tree, and especially a rat that would go up between the, the realm of the gods back to Midard, which was considered the, the world that we know, and then the underworld, or hell. That's where we get the name for hell, is from the Norse tradition. And that filigree living plant continues. Even this is the door that was on the uh, church yesterday in Akureyri. So that filigree is a continuation of that tradition of the tree, and even ourselves uh, have Christmas trees. And the, the old Norse worship of spirits and trees continues down to our modern traditions. Well, you can imagine they have these gatherings out in um, spiritual places uh, with this. This is the lure This has been excavated, a gigantic 10-foot horn that would call the gods down into uh, ritual places, and often that meant human sacrifice. They, this was a slave society. The slave, the word slave coming meaning Slavs. The B Norse would go over, the Vikings would go over into Russian areas in Eastern Europe and capture people, bring them back as servants. And this was uh, also offered as a sacrifice to the gods with musical instruments like that. Well, then, the, then there's the famous uh, Viking burial, which is a chieftain of a high enough uh, uh, status would build a special boat that would be laden with goods and it would be pushed off into the sea with sails up and shoot arrows and it would burn out at sea, and that was one burial. Inland they would bury in often a boat, again, on land. Um, but uh, this was a sort of a gruesome uh, tradition that, of course, ended with Christianity. But there are still graves around. The, the hills are haunted, and they're often just under a simple slab like this up in a, a village in one of the fjords. <clears throat> and then there are the burials in the bogs, this most famous in Denmark, where they would uh, have sacrificial uh, uh, offerings again and put them in the depth of a mud bog. And this is one of the famous uh, ones that came out of the, the mud a number of years ago. It's very well preserved and uh, study done on the diet and clothing and things. Well, their records were not on paper. They carved monuments in the runic alphabet I described on stones. And so you can see the, the world serpent and the tree imagery and then the inscriptions. Now, these uh, carvings have been deciphered pretty much, but they're usually describing a uh, memorial and uh, a place or some excursion and some victory. They're not extensive literature. Most of the tales were remembered orally. So there'd be the saga sayer, which would have a voluminous memory to speak for days and days about things that passed. And so the writing was not extensive, but it's still uh, curious because you can, you can pick it out. I saw t-shirts with this now. They write out modern slogans with it. Um, but in here, it was uh, King Gorm made this monument in memory of his wife, uh, Thierry, Denmark's adornment. And here's another one that said, my two sons uh, left home to go off to war. One went east and one went west and never, never came back. Well, so, so among scholars, this has been uh, uh, continuing research to try to put together the history by, based on these you know, fairly simple inscriptions. But... Uh, they've even found some in um, North America, maybe. They could, there was a famous Kensington stone that was found in Minnesota, which was later proved to be a, a local uh, trick. But you may dig in your backyard and still find some of this. But you'll find them in the small towns and the museums here. Uh, here's the standing stones at a church in, uh, in Norway. So these are fairly uh, lovely uh, Almost versions, of, we saw those Celtic sand, standing stones in uh, the Orkneys. Well, this is the tradition. You put up a big stone and inscribe it. Here's a modern gravestone, uh, again, up a valley in Norway. Well, <clears throat> well, then these people here, Norwegians especially, are inherently maritime-oriented because they'd lived in such isolated communities in great fjords, and the only way to get around to see their neighbors was often by going Viking or going around the bays and sailing around. So they developed the ship technology to go all the way to Iceland, Greenland, and these were, again, uh, uh, tremendously seaworthy for their time. Um, and, of course, many perhaps got lost, but uh, uh, many examples have actually been found in sites, archaeological or funeral sites around 
Scandinavia, but this again is the Bayeux tapestry of the Norman who really uh, originated in Olesen, Norway, north of Bergen, then they came to France and they attacked Paris, were given Normandy as a, as a, um, a peace offering, and then they went on to build ships and invade England. And here they are building uh, their, their wooden clinker built vessels. I'll show you a bit more about this just because we're on a ship and this is my interest, but they had two kinds of vessel. One, the Snore, which is the uh, military attack vessel, and then the Canard, which is a heavier, slower uh, cargo ship. And so these kind of vessels would travel all through Scandinavia, then to the British Isles, and then eventually down to, to um, Italy. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, one of the early kings of Sicily came from Norway. And so they had trading relations in ships like this all the way to the Middle East and to uh, North Africa. So these are fairly heavy, sturdy trading ships. You can see this one has cattle and a few decks, but they were pretty tough sailors. They did not need a cabin or room service. Anyway, here's one of the, the vessels that was found uh, in, uh, near, Os uh, near Oslo, the, uh, the great Oseberg ship, which was again found as a funereal offering. It may have never even gone to sea, but it's an example of the construction uh, with the, the uh, oak knees and then the um, planks, uh, the high prow with the serpent head on it. Now this is a characteristic, and, and some would say, well, this doesn't seem very practical, but these were the, uh, the snore, which were meant to attack and scare people, and that, that those great prows were um, used to come up and then to tie onto another vessel and then to board. And so in the sort of the Marine Corps of the time, that was a, an advantage. And some of these vessels were very big, 50 to 100 rowers, but still very shallow. And if they were in rough seas, they could take in the oars, cover over the oar holes at the upper left, and then you can see the, um, there's a strut there, and the whole sail rig was taken down and put on, put on deck. So these are very adaptable. And they were, again, with uh, oak knees and often a p pitch pine planking that would be quarter cut, this is called. And so this was fairly uh, tight. It would be riveted and caulked up. And uh, so they were f both flexible and seaworthy. And they probably had a bit of a leak, but uh, they were let's say the most advanced boat building of the era compared to the flat bottom Mediterranean trawlers. And we know them as having the first rivets, the pounded hot rivets to put this all together. And strong frames and so very seaworthy. So this, this has been um, uh, studied and they're now recreating, rebuilding a lot of this. But above all, they had a great steering board. Now that's before the post rudder like this ship has, which is actually a Chinese invention. But this was where the, the steering board was always on the, the starboard side, the right side of the ship facing forward. And that's where we get the name starboard, which is where the steering board on Viking ships used to be. And so it's not uh, easy to handle. It's pretty heavy and, and not balanced, let's say, like a modern post rudder. Now, this is one of the early anchors, so you can see it was, you know, they didn't want to waste good iron on it, so they actually just strapped a big rock in the middle of uh, timbers. So this may seem very rudimentary, but it was also very effective because the, the Viking boats could go all the way down to rivers and up in bays and then jump off and attack. They were not um, like later vessels have to stay offshore, have a dock. They could just ride up on the beach and do their uh, business, let's say. They could also drag them over great distances and in a portage. So this is where the Vikings became the terror of northern Europe and even to the Med, uh, Mediterranean because they came, arrived ready for action and their vessels were so uh, nimble above all. Well, this is the rig. <clears throat> uh, they didn't have hemp, so they used flax and they wove um, rope, braided rope without of flax, and then they um, also made uh, flaxen uh, sails, sort of like, like a light wool. And so this, again, has been recreated to uh, test out and see how well these do. So Norway, Sweden, Denmark, uh, various communities and museums of schools have sponsored, let's play Viking for the day and go out on these ships and test them out. So they've now built a few that have crossed the North Atlantic, and you'll see a few in the harbors. This is sort of a revived uh, tradition to learn how to do traditional boat building with the rivets and the, 
the great bow stem. And so we'll see a few of them out and around wherever we go. It's always a big event when one gets finally launched. Here's the stone ballast and the, the ribs and the, all the rigging ready, and then there they go. Now then the question is, is uh, how did they find where they were going? Especially, you see today we're out on a very cloudy north sea. Well, they had uh, what's called a solar compass. Now this is before the magnetic compass was introduced into the Mediterranean via Arab traders, but it came from China originally. So what they had in the olden days here was what's called a solar uh, po a pole, which was a, a let's say, a, a cylinder with the north, south, east, west on it, and then they would have a pole that would cast a shadow um, whenever they could have sunlight, and then they'd get an approximation of, by watching the sun and the shadow, where they were going. And they would often have a ribbon on top of that pole to um, then cite the wind direction, and then the rising of the sun or the setting of the sun would be the uh, the moment when you could find your latitude, yeah. or you had night, you'd have star sighting like I described before. But on a ship, of course, it's moving a lot, so they would put it in a bucket, and the, the solar compass would roll around, uh, but it would give a rudimentary uh, aid to navigation. But then what do they do on a day like today with the, the fog out there? And you're out sailing along thinking you're going uh, uh, to Iceland, and you may end up in Florida. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, uh, they had, I described this the other day, they called the sunstone or the Icelandic spar, which is a kind of a calcite quartz crystal that is mined in eastern Iceland. And this has the quality of uh, if you put a, uh, a, a black dot on it, <clears throat> a couple of them actually, then you, the, the the quartz will crystal uh, will polarize the su the latent sunlight that's coming through the clouds. So what you do, you aim that up in the sky, and where the polarization m merges the 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 dots, then that's where the sun is up there. And so this meant that on a very cloudy day, they could get a again a crude version of where the sun is and then where they are. So that it was considered a, a great secret navigator's uh, tool that. Sunstone. Well, they crossed from Norway. These are the Faroe Islands, which we'll be passing later today. Very dramatic cliffs out in the middle of the ocean, north of the Orkneys and Shetland Islands. Uh, then they would, again, latitude sail between Iceland and Norway. And on and on and on. Greenland, North America, up into um, Novograd, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, to Baghdad. There were Vikings living in uh, trading from Baghdad back in the 1100s. Uh, the, the, the Imperial Guard of uh, the, the, um, in Constantinople were called the Varangians, who were, again, Viking warriors who were mercenaries um, in, uh, in service to the, um, the court in Constantinople before it was taken over by the Ottomans. But they also came around in uh, North uh, uh, Western Europe to Portugal and into, again, Sicily and traded throughout the Mediterranean, sailed all the way back to Norway and brought um, goods they didn't have up there, especially spices and gold and different things they didn't have. Well, anyway, here's the, the great tradition of the, the Vikings on their summer holiday, going in the shopping again. But this is, we were in the UK before, and this was the first landing in 786 of the, Norm, the Norsemen attacking the a monastery and church at Linda's Farm, the holy island off of Northumbria. And so this was uh, the, the saying of the time written in Latin, or never before such terror appeared in, in Britain. And the old saying was, uh, you know, save us God from the wrath of the pagan Norse, Norsemen. And of course they did pretty much conquer much of England and Ireland and Iceland uh, where there was resistance. But, but these were considered the kind of sort of the, the terror of Europe for many centuries. And then they may have gone even further down into North America. This is subject, again, of a lot of archaeology and speculation and maybe uh, uh, a, a myth of a new kind. This is the Newport Tower in downtown Newport, Rhode Island, if anybody's ever been there. And this tower has been there since the English first settled there, and then the natives didn't know where it came from. And so some um, archaeologists and historians said, well, this may have been a, Nor a, a Norse 
construction of a time, but nobody knows where, where it came from or who built it. And so perhaps as archaeology goes on, we'll find more evidence of how far they extended their settlements before they either died out or went back to Norway. I showed this before also, the Bergen map, map of 1579, which shows North America, probably Newfoundland, Skrælingland, which is the, what they call the natives, and the different rocky coast, uh, and then Norway on the upper right side, and of course Greenland, Iceland in the center there. Well, the Norse culture changed dramatically when King Olaf uh, converted and ordered all of his different clansmen to convert to Christianity. And this then was a sea change for their, particularly their military aggressiveness. And they were called back to become uh, good Christian folk and not be at war. Of course, they continued that. But uh, Olaf is still venerated as the founder of Christianity in the 12th century for um, all the, uh, the Norse, including Sweden, Denmark, the rest of them. And here they are breaking up their old effigies and gods and uh, declaring their joining of greater Christendom. But the mythology and the, particularly the iconography of the Old Norse gods continued on. Here's a bishop's staff with, again, the, the dragon and different filigree, typical Norse. And then they built these churches. These are the famous stave churches. That uh, There are some around Bergen, but the, the more famous ones are up, up the coast. But this fantastic uh, construction of wood with its dragon filia, almost looks like a Chinese temple. This was typical of the early period of Christianity. And um, they, you know, they, they were trying to incorporate all of the other gods into, uh, let's say, this new uh, iconographic uh, religion that they adapted. But th these are, this, this very church itself is over 800 years old. And, and unfortunately, many of them were lost to decay or to, or to fire, but there are particularly beautiful Norwegian construction. And then I described all these other longboats were built and uh, <clears throat> became a very popular culture, particularly this is the 1880 uh, Chicago Exposition. And so many Norwegians especially had migrated to the Midwest that this became a whole um, popular uh, recreation of uh, the mythology of the past and the strong and dynamic Viking men and women that would uh, had, that had their way with Europe for a while. This is actually in France, the uh, the thousandth anniversary, the fo founding of Normandy. And if you've been to Rouen and Cayenne or these other places, they still are, uh, remember that they were originally from Norway, even if they adopted French ways. And then this martial spirit comes out occasionally. Here's a poster from the 1930s in Denmark to fight the Bolsheviks with Viking spirit. Well, it was also adapted by the Nazis somewhat, but uh, that didn't work out too well. But this uh, spirit is still remembered. Here's a festival they have every year in Lerwick, which is actually in Scotland, Shetland Islands, not far from where we're sailing by now, where they have a big bonfire and march around in the armor and. Uh, uh, relive the, the, the bad old days. And you can, again, see these and go out on a, on a longboat in numerous Scandinavian capitals. This one happens to be in Stockholm. Uh, and so the Nor Norway has had a, it, now it has about 6.5 million people, but they have as equally many that have emigrated, particularly to North America. So all through Midwest, Canada, U.S., there's a lot of uh, Norwegian communities that keep up some of the traditions. And then there was a period where Norway became the long for homeland, except that these pastoral scenes were also matched with a long, hard winter and a very diff difficult um, economic life. And the, sort of the old, uh, the old sod was calling and uh, made for this sort of uh, nostalgia for the old, old country, sort of like Ireland in that way. Um, but the reality was is that uh, these, these isolated communities often could not support themselves. And so there was a great deal of emigration from the, the, the fjord land and the uplands where life was so hard before modern transportation especially. And so Norway was considered the poorest country of Europe for much of the last couple of centuries. And so they packed up and they went to a new life in places where it was more economically viable. That's why there are more 
Norwegians living outside of Norway than in Norway. Um, but these scenes are pretty much gone because the, 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 the country has gone through a remarkable transformation, especially since it became independent from the uh, government of Denmark. It was under the Danish crown and government for hundreds of years after being traded with Sweden. So there's a, this was the accession of the king of Denmark, allowing the Norwegian subjects to uh, have their own royal family and then also their own um, constitutional monarchy. Uh, they, elect, they elect their king, actually, from Congress. And they have a, let's say, a, a, a ceremonial royal family. But to this day, the Norwegians, the Swedes, and the, Dan the, the Danes are always complaining about each other and don't really get along. And then, uh, but Norway, because of steam ships, suddenly became a great tourist destination back in the uh, late 1800s and to this day has become a major tourist industry. So here, the ship's coming up in the summer for the uh, view of the fjord land, and this is going on on this very ship. So uh, Norway then became a summer tourist destination, and all these places were people that actually left because it was so hard to live. So hotels were built, and we'll see this, is pretty well developed if still sparsely uh, populated. And so what we're, we're going to central Norway uh, into Bergen. Now Bergen's a very ancient trading town going back into prehistory because it has a very secluded bay and then right across the sea is uh, England. And uh, there's a ferry every day from Bergen to Newcastle. And uh, so we'll dock right here in the center harbor. Um, it's a town of maybe 400,000 people in the larger area. It spreads out on all the valleys, but it's surrounded by these beautiful mountains. And this in particular, uh, Fleuen, is a mountain right over the harbor, and there's a funicular ride. It's in the tour brochure. You can, you can go up there and go hiking around and get a great overlook of the city. It is surrounded by fjordland, so the transport before there were roads and airplane was very difficult. And again, it was a place for safe harborage for, and it was a member of the Hanseatic League, the great trading network that was all through northern Europe. So it has in its center harbor some medieval buildings that date from the 12th, 13th century, um, now preserved. It used to have a city wall to protect it from its unfriendly neighbors, perhaps, but uh, it was always a maritime center. And it is to this day. As you come in, there are all these uh, fish processing uh, uh, storage and uh, the, the fishing industry is uh, not what it used to be. But here's the uh, Bruggen, which uh, means the storehouses, literally. And this was the medieval trading center, and this is now shops. But you can go in, and these buildings are um, knocked together and hanging on to each other. And it's very much like a, a whole collection of dollhouses. But they're still occupied and still busy. Right off the harbor, we'll walk right there. And then there's some old churches and a few castles, and, but it's a very steep hill, right? You get off the docks and within five minutes you're facing a very steep hill, so it's a very tight town. Uh, here's the castle over the town, the Gamla Hagen Castle. Looks like a bit of a Disney castle itself. And then uh, um, walking areas, and uh, that's the Rosenkrantz Tower, which was originally a guard tower, and it's very busy, very tight little harbor. You can take little scooter ferry boats across it if you want to see the other side. And so it's very much a walking town, and, um, but uh, much more dense and uh, actually uh, ancient than Akureyri, where we were. So it's a very pleasant town. Here's the main train station. So once railroads were built, suddenly Norway could um, get goods all across from what were previously impassable valleys and fjords. So this is modern Norway, which has uh, become, as I said, one of the most prosperous uh, countries of all of Europe. Here's the walking pedestrian road right up from the, the harbor. And as you go up, you get the little neighborhoods that are sort of clinging on the heights. So there's a, there are no cars in these neighborhoods. It's all walkways. And as you go on up, you can get an overview of the whole town. And the, you know, the sons of Knut, as they're called, or the, the Norwegian community, is very, very proud. And they also have sister cities, particularly 
in uh, North America. Here's the Bergen Place in Seattle. So this uh, Norse spirit goes on in uh, other parts of the world now. I'll show you a little bit of Stavanger. Now this was uh, a uh, commercial city. I'm not sure what, symbolized by the eternal grapevine, but uh, that's uh, another story. But again, it's a port town right on the harbor. We'll be able to walk around um, the town, not quite as medieval as parts of Bergen, but it's still uh, upstanding. A lot, some of it's Art Deco, which is a style of the turn of the 1900s, um, which is preserved here. But again, you have maritime activities right downtown. There's, uh, this is formerly a, um, the great fishing capital. Now it's the center of uh, staging for the oil industry. So uh, this is actually a maritime training center where they practice in the emergency drop boats that you see on commercial ships and on oil rigs in particular. And so this town has gone through a cycle of the uh, center of the fishing industry and now it's uh, turned to oil as its main economic source. But here again, the, the harbor, we'll be going in right to the old town in the center of this. There are lakes and parks and it's a lovely town actually. It was very prosperous for the last uh, couple of centuries because of the fish, fishing trade. Uh, I saw that there's an excursion out to an Iron Age farm, a recreated homestead. So this is um, something you can see, uh, look into the past with the the turf roofs and the, the, the very primitive living that was here in ancient time, the Ulhag farm. But Stavanger has a lot of neighborhoods just off the docks that are, uh, let's say, modest houses for the fisher folk. And it used to be full of canneries. So those uh, sardine and herring tin cans that we've had in our life uh, uh, mostly came from Stavanger. And so this is a town that used to have a, quite an odor to it when all of the, the canneries were there, but now that has completely crashed and there's very little catch at all. Uh, here's what it used to look like with uh, the, the landings for the fish and the tin can. There's a little museum of, of canning if anything, anybody's interested. But unfortunately, the, uh, the, the North Sea is pretty much fished out. It used to have tremendous stocks of cod, just like in... Uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, king cod used to be the great uh, food for Europe. It was caught, salted, dried, and was the, uh, the nutrition for much of the European population. Now it's become a delicacy because it's all been fished out to the point where even in Canada you, there's no more cod industry. The other one was herring. And so this was what Stavanger was based on, was the great clouds of herring that were out at sea and they would bring them in. And again, the overfishing has meant now there's almost no none left. And this is a great tragedy for the ocean, but you know, some, now they're out fishing in the Arctic and a Africa and all kinds of places for the last commercial catches. And then it used to also be a whaling center. And the, uh, every summer, um, Norwegian and Dutch and English fleets would come up the Norwegian coast chasing the whales all the way up to the Arctic. And this is still going on. The Norwegians have insisted that there's enough still to hunt. And we saw a few off of Iceland. Those are minke whales we saw yesterday. And we may see a few, but again, there's only a remnant, small trace of the original population. But they have insisted against uh, the International Whaling Commission that this is their tradition. Of course, the Norwegians invented the harpoon gun, which led to the decimation of what are left. They and the Japanese and the Icelanders are the last ones who continue this tradition against international law, but that's another issue. I'll show you a little bit more in the far north. This is Svalbard, which is an archipelago uh, about 500 nautical miles north of the Norcop tip of Norway of the mainland, and this is a great icy um, expanse of islands that we used to go up and sail around uh, years ago, uh, but it's right, uh, you can see it, that group of islands just south of the polar ice cap. We used to sail from Bergen and North Cap or Reykjavik up there and sail around there. Uh, now it is, uh, it's, a lot of that ice I just showed you is now gone and the polar ice cap is retreating. And But this is, we would go up there and do polar bear research years ago, which was uh, scary because uh, as they say in Iceland, you don't want to befriend a polar bear because they'll have you for lunch. But uh, this is the far north, which is very important to the Norwegians. They are an Arctic nation and 
are part of the Arctic Convention to try to now see what to do if the seas clear up and there's suddenly shipping crossing from Europe to Asia over the North Pole. That's a, a big change in world commerce and also a lot of effect on the um, environment. So they are have research institutes up in those far places to see what's going to happen. Um, but meanwhile, back in Stavanger, on a day like today, you can go to the beach. This is uh, sunny, warm uh, southern uh, Norway. And of course, we're, not, we're a little far northwest of Oslo, the capital. But on the south coast of Norway, there are actually beaches facing Denmark on a nice day. Here's again Stavanger in the, in the park, a very pleasant city. There's no beach right in the city of Stavanger. But, uh, they have medieval era churches like this Domkirke and uh, the commercial district. Again, this is not a political capital. It's very much a business town now um, thriving because of Stat Oil and the Norwegian uh, oil industry, which is along with Scotland pretty much uh, explored and have been uh, exporting oil from here for the last a uh, number of decades now with the drop in the price of oil, they're having a, a let's say, a shakedown in the industry. You see a lot of old rigs coming in because they're being decommissioned. Uh, but now they're putting um, seabed um, drilling and supply with offshore um, production ships. That's the new business is actually to refine the oil out at sea and uh, also have uh, subsea technology that will extract it. They're going out further and deeper to find more, but again, because of the price of oil, um, it, it's not economical. And so this is a real question whether in 50 years there'll be any of this business left. But this has meant Stavanger has had decades now of high investment, and then it's all come back and been reinvested. So the new thing in Stavanger is the oil museum of exploration with a lot of geology, technology display. So if you have interest in it, that's a, probably the best uh, illustration of this industry, but um, that's also meant that the town could afford new um, stations, new schools, new this, There's a, this is part, part of the university, uh, so there you'll see a, a, a spankingly new and uh, uh, bright uh, Stavanger, a new art museum, so this is the benefit of their industry while they can. Um, and they're also investing now in wind farming because they, uh, they're trying to find an alternative. And so this is a, also a new industry to put windmills all through so they themselves will uh, have, let's say, what they call it, what will bring the future after oil. So this, this you'll see around. And they also have considerable transport along the Norwegian coast. If you ever come back and just want to stay in Norway, you can take what they call the Hurtig uh, Ruten, which means the, the, um, the quick way around uh, all of the land, literally in Norwegian. And so these are cruise ship scale ferries that you can get on and off at every port, load on trucks and goods, and they go all the way up to the farthest north of Norway. And um, in the wintertime now, they're sending a couple of ships to Antarctica because they're ice class. They're able to manage the heavy ice and weather. And so Norway has become such a prosperous country and also linked in with international media and youth culture. So here's idle in Norwegian and uh, the you know they're very energetic people and now they're all connected to the world no longer isolated like in the battle days but last time I was in Stavanger they're having the world's international beach volleyball contest which I don't know I'd wear a I'd wear a fur ba uh, bathing suit if I had to be in that one but anyway it's a lively town especially in the summer and I'll leave you with the last couple of uh, uh, a bit of uh, Norse humor again. Hagar here. I see Sven and Gretel are back together after ironing out their differences. How did that happen? She hit him with her iron. Well, anyway, I, uh, uh, there's a there's a other humor, uh, most of which makes fun of uh, Swedes and Danes. I'll, I'll leave that out. But uh, you'll notice in the shops, like in Iceland, that the prices are pretty extreme, and this is a lot due to the fact they have their own currency, they have their own high-value products. Um, so here's the story. Why do you need a stepladder to go shopping in Norway? Because the prices are so high. And uh, wh why do Swedes crawl on, on the floor in the shops in Norway? Because they're looking for low prices. 
Well, these are the clean jokes, I assure you. And, uh, but I'll, I'll just leave you with a, a bit of Norse words that we use every day. Um, particularly Sunday through Friday, those are all Norse. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Saturday is not, that's Roman. Thing, that was originally the parliament. Fish, also whale, hut, husband, you can read them all down. And so you have all these uh, words that we use in English that actually came from Norse tradition, whether Norway or Sweden or Denmark. And then I listed some of the heritage that we share somewhat uh, self-confidence and national pride in, and a, a rugged individualism but with responsibility in a very egalitarian society. So they, you, you heard about the, the, say, the social policies of Scandinavia, Norway, they make among the most equal society in the world. Having wealth is uh, usually known, but nobody's very ostentatious, and they have very high taxes above all. Um, and so, for instance, Norway has a sovereign fund of how many billion, trillion dollars, and they've already saved enough to have free education, free medical care, and free pensions for everybody for the next three or four generations, which uh, sounds very un-American to me. But um, they're also very adventurous, healthy, outdoor-minded people, entrepreneurial, democratic, and uh, they have something called Almansrek, which unlike some other places in Norway or Scandinavia, you are allowed to walk across anybody's property as long as you keep walking. And you may pick berries and mushrooms, but you have to keep moving. And that's the egalitarian law that dates from ancient times in, in Scandinavia. Now I say women's rights and the home security, uh, that's uh, sort of in the constitutions and the law here. They require all corporate boards to be half women. They require local elections to have women candidates. And so they, they're probably the most equal society like that. Um, but they also have also uh, marriages become a second, uh, secondary, and most children are born to single women who are then well paid to stay home and take care of their babies before they go back to work. But most um, parents are not married. Uh, so that's maybe the way of the world. The last thing I list is the price of prosperity, which is also called affluenza. What was a very poor society has become um, overly uh, prosperous in ways the Norwegians complain that now people are jealous of each other, they get ostentatious, they start dressing up, they get fancy cars. These are the sort of things that Norwegians didn't do before they suddenly had more money than they knew, knew what to do with. But anyway, that's just their good luck, perhaps. And I'll, I'll, I'll just show you a little bit more out of as we go into Norway, and this is the subject of this ship, we'll have a cruise next week that is just Norway to go up further up to Olesund and all these fjords and it is one of the most beautiful cruising grounds uh, in the world along with maybe Alaska um, with uh, everywhere you go it's a it's a sea world and a mountain scape and so it's particularly beautiful and uh, so it's uh, a great treat one of the things they've been building in recent years to improve their infrastructure what they call uh, ship tunnels and here's one further north where you can see how variegated the fjord land is. And, and just to get over to the next town, you'd have to drive for so far. And particularly in the wintertime, the, the various ferry boats that go up there, they, they have to go out onto rough seas and come back in. So with their prosperity, they have the engineers building tunnels through the mountains. And so you'll come up to a mountain, and the ship will go right through it with enough water to float through and then they'll pop up on the other side, save hundreds of kilometers of sea, or sea miles to go around. So this is, again, the, the benefit of the prosperity of Norway, that they take shortcuts right through the mountains. And so uh, you'll get to see plenty of the scenery as we go along, but I'll, I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll leave you with, uh, oh, a couple of Ole and Lena jokes, I'm sure you've. I'm sure you've heard them, uh, the sort of thing that they tell up echoing in the valleys of the... So, Lena goes to the doctor and she says to the doctor, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting creaky. And the doctor says, well, you're not getting any younger. And to which Lena says, I didn't come here to get younger. I just want you to keep me alive so I can get older. And uh, the other one... Uh, 
Ole's on dying in bed, and he knows that you must have heard this one. And so Lena goes and starts making a lutefisk, a fish, a fish and potato casserole that smells so good. And uh, Ole says, oh, before I die, could I just have a taste of that? It's my favorite dish. And Lena says, no, 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 it's not for you. It's for the funeral at reception. And so there's a bit of uh, what they call schwarz humor, a, a dark humor around here, and uh, you know, developed in the long winter, perhaps. Another one I like, in a, a, uh, a farmer has a dog that he teaches how to play cards, and the dog can hold the cards, and he, so he teaches it how to play poker. And so they all have poker games, and then they realize, oh, I made a big mistake about this. A friend's like, why, you taught your dog to play poker? Isn't that great? And the guy says, well, the dog can keep a straight face, but whenever he gets a good hand, he wags his tail. <laughs> well, anyway, I hope you have a, enjoy the scenery of Norway and a bit of the culture and uh, uh, this magnificent land that we're lucky to come and visit. And uh, so and after my couple of talks here, I just want to leave you the last word. I hope I've showed you things that you didn't get to see and uh, made what you did see more interesting. And as the old saying goes, I... I saw more than I remember, but now I remember more than I saw. <laughs> and uh, in, uh, after that uh, tale up the, uh, the fjord line, this is the great pulpit rock, which I believe there's an excursion out of Stavanger. This is the most dramatic overlook of all the fjords. And so the last word I'll leave you, an old Norse saying, uh, the time that you spend at sea does not add to your age ashore. So the longer you stay on a ship, especially this one, you could live forever. And with that, I say thank you very much and have a great trip in Norway. My pleasure to sail with you. Thank you.